today we're going to talk about creating wall hangings like this. Uh, this is a V-carved pattern on a piece of just standard nasty MDF wood, uh, the stuff that you get at Home Depot all the time. It's done with, a, in this case, a silver coating of paint, um, a second coating of glow-in-the-dark paint, just because I thought that would be fun, and then there's a way to work black paint into all of the grooves wipe it down and you get this nice contrasting finish like this. So what I'm going to talk about today is taking a design like this online, tracing it in Inkscape and bringing it into Carbide Create and setting it up for v-carving. We're going to start here with a design I found on DeviantArt by uh, someone named Yukashiro Yu. Uh, hopefully I'm not mangling that too badly. Uh, Yukashiro Yu has said that they're fine with us with People using this design for anything they like so I'm comfortable using it for a CNC demonstration what we're going to do is we're going to take this design we're going to pull it into a program called Inkscape and I'll show you how to trace it and bring it into something that carbide create will understand so this is Inkscape and it's similar in some ways to what you're used to already in Carbide Create. It's a vector-based program. You can do things like squares and circles, polygons, freehand drawing. You can add text in. But as you can also tell, it's a lot more complicated than Carbide Create. I'll probably do a short tutorial on this at some point. But today, we're really only going to use one particular feature in this. We want to be able to bring in our design, and we want to be able to trace it. So to begin with, I'm going to go ahead and open up our design. All right. And it resizes our window, which is fine. Okay, so here's our original design, and it's one big piece, right? So what we need to do is have something that will break this into paths, and we do this with what's called a trace. Uh, trace bitmap here under the path menu. Now, this is a little bit complicated. We'll go ahead and expand this out quite a bit. Um, what you want to use here is brightness cutoff. Basically what that does is it says I'm going to make paths where the light and the dark places cut off. So you can see there's a threshold here that you can raise and lower and this will kind of let you know whether or not you've got um, a good contrast between your lines. So if we pop this up a little bit and update it again, you'll see we're getting some, some more definition there. I'm going to go ahead and bring this up a little further. Okay, so that looks pretty good, I think. And we're going to hit OK. Now, one thing that's a little bit of annoying is you notice I've hit OK, and the window doesn't close. This is something Inkscape does. It kind of drives me a little nuts. Just hit OK once, and then close this. Now, if you look at it immediately, the first thought is, well, nothing changed. But what we've actually got here is two of these. The one on top is our vector that we just created. And the one below is our original. And I can get rid of, click on that one below, and hit delete. And now you can see we've just got one of these, right? And if you decide this doesn't have enough definition for you, you can go ahead and delete, you know, start over and delete this one and try again. But for right now, that this should be fine for what we're doing for demonstration purposes. So now that we've got this as a vector object, we're going to go ahead and save this file as an SVG. The SVG format is something that Carbide Create will understand. So I'm just going to save this as design1. SVG, make sure it's Inkscape SVG is fine and hit save. Okay, now we should be able to import this into Carbide Create. So over in Carbide Create, I'm going to start out with a stock size of 15 by 15 inches, 3 quarter, I'm going to be using 3 quarter MDF, lower left is fine, MDF wood, I'm going to set this retract height 
to about two millimeters because we don't want it to go far and this will help save us some time. So now what we want to do is import and we want to grab the file that we got. Okay, and you notice it starts out really small, but we don't care because it's paths. We can resize paths any size we want. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to make it about 14 and a half. And I and drag this up here. I think I'm going to shrink that down just a hair. Let's go ahead and make it 14 because I want room for a cutout as well. Okay, cool. So now we've got this selected. These are going to be the areas we v-carve, right? And I want something that will cut this shape out. So for right now, I need to go ahead and split these up real quick. And I want to select, zoom in, and select just the outer line right here. So reset our view. Now I want to go ahead and give myself an offset. And I'm going to do, let's see, about an eighth of an inch and see what that looks like. Yeah, that should be fine. So that'll be the cutout of the design, and the rest of that will be V-Carve. So now what I want to do is make sure I've got everything selected, except that outer piece. And I'm going to go ahead and group those back together again. And that'll make it easier for us to set our tool paths. So we're doing basically two tool paths. We're going to V-Carve all of this stuff, and then we're going to cut this along the outer arm, and that'll cut out the shape of our design. So for your toolpath, we're going to come over here and we're going to select V-Carve. And let's see, yeah, it's got my, this is my uh, 60 degree end mill. I really wish Carbide Create would put the angle on these, but they don't for some reason. Um, click OK, and we're just going to call this path V-Carve. V-Arve. Okay, so now we've got that. And you'll notice that down here my little button has gone gray and says that it's calculating. It's calculating because it's creating somewhere in the neighborhood of 117,000 lines of executable G-code. So this does take quite a while. Um, and one thing that I would recommend that you do is create your tool paths last because anytime you move this, it's going to have to recalculate those tool paths again and you'll get this long pause while it's calculating. So go get a cup of coffee or a sandwich and let it do what it needs to do and we'll come back when it's done. So now that our paths are all set it's good to go in and zoom in and look and make sure that it is tracing all the things that you think it is tracing because Carbide Create will only go so deep into the design to create these V paths. Now, it looks like all of these are cutting just fine. Um, one thing I am noticing, though, is this area right here um, looks like it's going to lose some definition. Let's switch this over to MDF and do the simulation. And this is going to calculate out things and see what they look like. Okay. Now, some of the lighter stuff just doesn't come out, and that's fine. It'll come out fine in the wood. But again, where I was talking about those circles right here, you notice that we've lost the definition in there, and it's doing a really big, deep path around that. Let me show you why that is. So, in our design, I'm going to go back to our design section and unselect, right? So, when it creates this V path, this V bit is following this little line here and then it's digging out this entire area which is probably not quite what we want we're not going to get the definition that we want of this particular piece so what you can do then is modify the design and I'm going to take a circle I may need to shrink that just a hair but uh, turn off snap to grid 
get that to where it's approximately centered in there and pull the radius down slightly Yeah, that looks about right. So now what's going to happen is when our V-bit comes down, it's going to go around this and leave this piece here raised and then V-bit out this piece. So I'm going to add these circles in here around the rest of these dial pieces to go ahead and give us a little bit more definition there. If we reset our view and go ahead back to our toolpath, you'll see a big difference in how these lay out delete this V carve. Actually I can double click on it now I think about it. Select everybody and select my outer one. Tell it OK and that should recalculate. OK so now that we've got that let's go ahead and do our, our simulation again and see if that doesn't look a little bit different for that one. Okay, Oop. so now you see we've got a little bit more definition on this, and it's just going to be carved out this piece here. Again, these simulations aren't great all the time, but they'll at least give you an idea of where things are going to position and sort of how they're going to shape out. So we'll go back in and we'll add our circles around to the rest of these, and then we should be ready to define our paths and save our G-code and cut. Okay, so here's our V-carve path now, and you can see I've added in all of my circles around these so that this area is now going to stay raised, and then it'll V-carve this little bit seam here. That should give us some better definition. The last thing I need to do, now that we've got all the V-carve stuff set up, is to do the cutout for our outside path. So, select that. We're going to do a contour. We're going to use just a quarter inch bit. In mill, fine with that. Stock bottom, and we're going to do outside right. And we'll just call that cut out. Okay, now this is going to have to get done in two separate operations. So, what you'll need to do is disable this one, save your V card your vcarve code and then disable this guy or enable that guy disable this guy and do just the cutout and that's the one we'll do with our quarter inch bit Okay, and now we've got our two pieces of, of G-code done, and let's go ahead and do a carve. So one of the other nice things about a project this size is it'll definitely tell you if you've got high spots in your wasteboard. Um, you'll notice I've got nice definition here on this side almost up to about here and even somewhere you know in this area but as I get closer onto this side I've got a low spot somewhere in my wasteboard that's making my bit not push down quite as hard in this area over here so I probably need to go ahead and resurface this or resurface the, the wasteboard rather and um, go ahead and give this another try Okay, so in order to fix the issues I had with this not carving as well because it was low, I went ahead and took a couple of shims, loosened these clamps up just slightly, and pushed the shim underneath it to raise this piece up. I took my, um, my bit and brought it over in here and dropped it down to what was zero down in this corner, down the corner, and dropped it down into zero and brought this up until it touched so that way I knew that this was would be level with the other end so then I did a second pass and 
it's better to spend the extra four hours and go ahead and recut it than to leave this piece shallow like it was and just have wasted four hours. So next we get to finish and paint this. So if most of you have done any kind of work with MDF, you know it can be kind of a pain in the butt as far as painting it goes, uh, especially things like the edges and such. You need to get something that'll seal this wood. And so what I recommend doing first thing before, um, before you put any other paint on it is go ahead and put a coat of this on there, the bullseye shellac. Uh, you can pick this up at Home Depot anytime you want. And you'll do a nice coat on your dial once you've done all your V carving. You'll go ahead and put a good coat of this shellac on there. That'll seal it and let it take the paint a little bit better. Um, you also want to let that shellac dry completely. Uh, give it a couple of days to let it set. And then you can go ahead and start doing your painting. Okay, so once the uh, shellac is dried, you're going to want to take something like a very, very light sandpaper or a steel wool and knock all the little knobby bits off of this because it'll get some some fuzzies in here and then we're going to go ahead and put on this it's a metallic silver paint um, if you get these don't get the textured versions the textured versions tend to fill in some of the fine lines and we don't want that but uh, we're just going to go ahead and use this to get our basic coat and then we'll put on our glow in the dark coat after that um, some of you may recognize the box that I'm using as the box that my Shape Oko 3 came in. So this has been my spray booth for about a year and seems to work just fine. And we're just going to do light coats and build them up over time. We don't need to do anything incredibly heavy. All right. I'm going to call that done and we're going to go ahead and let that dry for a day or two before we put on the uh, glow in the dark coat. So now that our silver paint is dried, we're going to go ahead and put a couple of coats of this uh, Rust-Oleum glow in the dark paint on. This is a reasonably clear paint. It puts a little bit of a kind of a milky sheen over things, but uh, for the most part it'll go, it'll go ahead and dry clear and that's what will give us our glow in the dark piece. So we're just going to go ahead and do some even coats of that. You always want to turn this and get good coverage in all the little crevices areas. that dry for a couple of days and make sure that it's cured nice and tight and solid and then we will go back in and do the last of the black acrylic piece okay so now we've got our painted piece it's got the coat of silver on it it's got the coat of uh, glow-in-the-dark clear on it and the next thing we want to do is define all of our V carved areas here now to do that what we're going to do is we're going to use an acrylic paint and a paintbrush and we're just going to work that paint into those areas once we've got a small area painted we're going to take this sanding block which is just kind of a, a soft sanding block wrapped in a moist piece of uh, rag and we're going to wipe off and that should leave the paint inside these areas and take off most of the paint up top so I've got some rags up here I've got my little sanding block. You can use these fiber sanding blocks or a cork one. It's also pretty good. Uh, a little bit of water. We don't want to get a lot of water on this, remember, because it is MDF and it has MDF. It, if you get it really wet, it's going to turn into mud. All right, so do little sections of this at a time and make sure to get all of it off before it dries. If it's really a particularly warm day, you may find that it dries quite a bit quicker than you expected. So I'm gonna try from the center out and let's get one of these a little bit wet. And wrap our block up. Okay, there we 
right. And we just wrap it around the block and that gives us a good flat spot to use. So let's start from the center. And I just wanna work that paint in there the best I can. Now some of the deeper areas are gonna require a little bit more you know, globbing it in there. Whereas these lighter areas, I can usually just get a quick brush stroke on. So for this, I'm probably going to go ahead and try to just get one circular area and then wipe things down. our block and wipe it across like that and you definitely want to you know move this around the towel a little bit so you're not just wiping the same paint on again and yeah you're gonna get this all over your fingers so just kind of deal with that and you end up with A nicely defined area like that and you'll notice it also adds a kind of a patina to this which is fine we kind of like that uh, gives it a more almost like old metal coin look which is nice and then it's just a matter of pick your area start and go from there you missed and take a look for any areas where you may have gotten like big old thumbprints on stuff or it looks like you've got wiping marks from this one thing that's really key for this is when you're first doing your first couple of wipes after you put the paint on make sure you're using a clean section of the cloth otherwise what you get is you're wiping this mess right back into your design so you get a much better uh, clean an edge to it if you go ahead and use just a nice clean section of your cloth. Alright, and I think that should have us. So one of the things that can be a little bit problematic when dealing with MDF is trying to use any kind of hanging material for it. So if I'm going to be hanging something like this on a wall, what I'll typically do is I'll drill myself two little recesses with a pair of Forester bits and then I will cut myself a circle using the uh, Shapeoko that looks a little bit like this. Once I've got my circle cut out to fit right into that recess, I can go ahead and glue that piece in and then I've got like the little hole up top and this will be actually wood so this will be cut out of something like uh, plywood and that way I've got the hole there and I also countersink two holes and drop two screws in this way when I hang this on the wall the force of the hanging is on the wood piece and not on the MDF this keeps it from tearing out in places so what you want to do is let the room get really nice and dark and then I want you to take a black light flashlight and shine it on your dial okay just let just run it around a couple of times like this right this will supercharge the glow in the dark stuff and when you turn the light off you get this mm -hmm. 